Hi, I'm Joe Quirk. Welcome to the Blue Frontiers podcast about all my favorite things, seasteading, the environment, special economic zones, and innovation in science, technology, governance, and society itself. Today on the Blue Frontiers podcast, we have my friend Max Borders, co-founder of Voice and Exit, author of Super Wealth, a book which has significantly influenced my thinking. And I'm honored to be one of the first people to receive his brand spanking new book, Social Evolution, which I'm looking forward to reading and like all really valuable books, leads to entrepreneurship. Um, Max has written a lot of incisive essays as editor for the Foundation for Economic Education, and you're going to enjoy this conversation with Natalie Meza Garcia. Hello, Seasteaders. I am here right now with Max Borders, co-founder of Voice on Exit, and also author of the book Social Singularity, The Social Singularity, a Decentralist Manifesto. How are you, Max? Doing very well, thank you very much. Max, I have just opened the table of contents of your book. Uh, thank you very much for this copy, by the way. Absolutely. Can you please tell us? <laughs> so your first chapter is called The End of Politics. <laughs> the End of Politics, that's right. Why do you talk about? Well, I wanted to start the book that way. I figured if, if anybody can get through that chapter, they can get through the rest <laughs> of the book because that's the darkest, oh, darkest chapter. I love it. We have, treat, we have in, for many years, treated politics as a kind of, of God, uh, as this uh, omnipotent entity that we, we want to imbue with our most sacred values. Well, it turns out that the people in politics are not angels and that the voters have very little power. Um, when you think of it in statistical terms, you're crying a teardrop in the ocean when you try to affect change through the yeah. democratic process. <laughs> yes. So I just spend the first part of the book disabusing people of their their um, biases towards politics as a mechanism of social change because I believe that it is almost completely ineffective and ineffectual and also counterproductive. It divides us. It makes us emotionally um, rancorous towards one another. It causes us to be more tribal in our instincts. Yes. And I don't think it's healthy anymore. It's outlived its usefulness. Yes, it's true. Um, you mentioned today the concept of mutual aid, and I was really happy. Are you a Kropotkin fan? Oh, well, um, <laughs> to, to, to a degree, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you and, 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 and certainly that's an influence on, on this, this concept. Oh, yeah. History as well, but... But sure, yeah, mutual aid. Um, so we are in we are in the process of very very quickly um, starting a company uh, or an organization, I guess you could say, a cooperative devoted to the idea of mutual aid. It used to be uh, historically a phenomenon that was very common, at least in the English speaking world, and um, there are some analogs also in in other parts of the world with uh, the way churches dealt with things. Okay. But these are were secular societies, mutual aid societies, where people pooled resources and looked after each other. Okay. Those are different from the class sort of the 20th century welfare state because. Um, in the welfare state, it's just about dispensing resources to people who meet certain minimum thresholds. Yes. But it's not about community involvement. It's not about yeah. networks and the invisible filaments that bind us as people, yeah. the local knowledge we have about each other. You would know probably don't give Max uh, any more resources from the pool because he's just going to drink it. He's just <laughs> going to spend it on, yeah. on, on bourbon. And I would. <laughs> but anyway, can you see I, what I mean. Can I just spend it with me on purpose? <laughs> yeah, we, we, they, they shouldn't give us any of the resources. <laughs> but but you, you get my point. We, we at, at, as members of a community, not only need to look out for each other in terms of resources, but we should look after each other also in terms of stewardship of the whole community versus those who are um, making claims against the resource pool. But the whole idea of a mutual aid society is to ensure that pe that we can look out for each other. And how do we do that? How do we functionally do that? And I look to biological systems for that uh, for that primary edifice. How? So we have a framework we're developing through a technology called Holochain. Yes. Holochain is an alternative to blockchain. It's very, very different in the way it's designed, but it's much more human-centric. So where blockchain uh, depends on a distributed ledger that, that has 
people only at the periphery. Holochain has people everywhere. So if blockchain is disintermediation technology, Holochain is hypermediation. That means you involve more people at the level of the network and you bring to bear their specific skill sets and capabilities and oversight and reputation. And it, it is a fascinating technology in this way. So w what we're doing is building what is known as a DISC. And this is one of these acronyms, you know, I couldn't help myself, but DISC, <laughs> <laughs> DISC stands for Distributed Income Support Cooperative. Distributed Income Support Cooperative. So it's a form of uh, mutual aid. It's a mechanism for mutual aid. So instead of um, you would you would pay fees into a, um, you know people d depending on their ability to pay, um, and there will be variations on that. Not a, you know probably not going to want to design a disc where everybody has to pay the same amount because they're going to be big fish and little fish, right? Yes. But when you think of this in terms of not being exactly a market and not being exactly a charity, but something in between. Yes. Everybody thinks of our community as a whole. So you contribute to the pool, but you're also looking out for each other as stewards of the resources in that pool, and it could be for anything. Are you familiarized? Based, based, this question is based on what you've just said, with the work of Eleanor Ostrom? On Absolutely. Governing the Commons? She is one of my heroes. Yay! <laughs> High five! I love it. You know that her and her husband um, wrote a book on polycentricity. Yes, yeah. absolutely, uh -huh. and and um, I actually scored a <laughs> digital copy the other day that I think is probably um, of one of their books on polycentricity and governance um, that I think is from actually from Vincent, her husband. Yeah, Vincent Ostrom. And uh, I, I scored a copy the other day that's probably um, probably an Ill illegal copy. Uh, somewhere, somehow I got, got a hold of it, but I'm uh, so happy to have it because it's out of print, I think. Yeah, no, a lot of her texts, I don't know why, you look for them online and they don't have, they are in PDF, mm -hmm. but it's this photocopy scan thing where you cannot really highlight or copy or paste, it's just the picture. Right. It's I think the, the, they have some thought that needs to be, that enjoy a renaissance. Not to, not to go too, too far off track here, but uh, the Ostroms both. Oh. need to be republished and, and re-marketed to I the agree. world. And you know, we move in a very anarcho-capitalist context, mm -hmm. but what I see that you bring is a social component that Ostrom criticizes that the market on its own doesn't have. So she proposes the middle point that you are talking about. Um, so a lot of people, I know she wasn't explicitly anarcho-communist, but a lot of people, when they think of, their, of her work about commons, well, she's very, she's very much, on, she never said it, but you read along the lines, mm -hmm. right? And so I, with her work, and when, when I read her and when I read David Friedman, I see that even if they seem to be in a both opposite side of the spectrum, they share so many, many things in common. And I really like the fact that you are using these contemporary cutting edge technologies that right now are mostly used from a very in a very market-centric perspective, right? Uh, but you also try to put like that middle point human component of, of you know what, maybe post ideology. Let's just exactly. go with what, with what is right for this specific experiment, for this territory, for this community. Yes. You know? Exactly. Look, you know this this entire dualistic thinking about. Um, uh, oh, we must do capitalism. Everything has to be about markets, 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 markets. On the one hand, and then on the other, is everything, we have to centrally plan to ensure that people yeah. are helped out, uh -huh. the, the poorest people in the world are helped out. Um, I'd say to both of them, no. Exactly. It, nor the market, yeah. nor the state on yes. their own are sufficient. It, if we have voluntary arrangements exactly. that people can enter into and create value within them, and that value can be captured from head value, as in what we might call head value, which is the market phenomenon. Do I have a token that's gaining in value? Or am I getting dividends or me, me, me? Or do I have um, 
a token that where I'm contributing to a commons and I'm helping be a good steward of my community and expressing love through the system and both of those forces are working in common, exactly. we are unstoppable as a exactly. species. Exactly. I know. I, I completely agree. And that's where I see that she meets Mark, uh, Debbie Freeman really, really, really closely and how projects like the ones we are involved, like Seasteading and Startup Societies, are a catalyst for those really interesting interactions that come from perspective that prioritize the market as a solution to many things and also those that say hey you know what maybe if we just localize decision making in these small communes so poof, i yeah. love it uh, yeah i exactly. absolutely love it i'm right now working on a paper called elinor ostrom meets david friedman on assisted nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice so when i heard you today mm -hmm. speaking about polycentrism it was like wow i need to talk to you can you explain and elaborate more how what is your view on polycentrism sure let me and, and if, if you don't mind i'll 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 make a slight distinction too. I'll explain polycent polycentrism or polycentricity on the one hand, and then on the other, uh, uh, polyarchy. Yeah. Okay. So polycentricity, and 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 there might be better uh, explanations for this, but the way I understand it is, um, in a way that most people might not think of it, but that is rules attached to territory. Most of the rule sets we are governed by in this world are in some sense attached to terra firma. Yes. And so um, poly polycentrism is the idea that if those rules are sufficiently broken up into smaller centers of power, then we have opportunities to move about, to migrate between those centers of power or among those centers of power. And there is no better way of describing this than seasteading yeah, because exactly. the seasteading units are mobile and they can have their own governance models that they adopt and they can move around and if you don't exactly. like being near someone who doesn't share your perspective on governance you can move away and yeah. reorganize in another way right yes. there are going to be network effects yeah. involved that make it difficult sometimes to extricate yourself from a community yes. in seasteading yeah but still there is there is this kind of uh, evolutionary phenomenon that happens with self-organization um, with seasteads. Yes. That is that is the basic, and so instead of being part of terra firma, it's part of a uh, seasteading platform, but it's still um, atta rules attached to something. Yes. Whereas, uh, polyarchy means that before you attach it to anything, you grab it from the cloud. You grab it from you grab it from someone's ideas, you grab it from a rule set, you, you can use a token, whatever you want to that is a, a representation of an idea set or an institutional set of rules. Polyarchy says there's competition for these things and you can choose whichever ones you want and they're available to you for um, as you join a club or adopt them open source or pay for them, they are available to you in the cloud and, and so Polyarchy is the idea that there is a competitive set of institutions that you can choose from and ascribe to your terra firma or your seastead or whatever. I love it. So yeah. you look at both combined, like a polycentricity for what has to do with the physical territory and polyarchy mm -hmm. for things that are more ethereal. I think that's probably I think that's probably fair. Now I don't know if other people would define it that way. I define it that way just because um, there was a uh, the man who coined the term, who was I think a student of uh, Molina Molinari, um, the uh, the the classical liberal thinker from the 19th century. Um, there was a, a man named Pauli Mille Dupuis. He was a Belgian fellow, and he was the first to articulate this idea. It's also called panarchy. And the idea is that you can have multiple competing, Anarchy. yeah, multiple competing jurisdictions, and the choice of jurisdiction could be done from one's bedroom slippers. He said. <laughs> so I really like that. That, um, and I thought I was the first to think of it. And of course, he had beat me by 150 oh, years. <laughs> so, I've had that repeated so many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. So and then I, right uh -huh. after that, got mixed up with. Uh, the people who are working on seasteading. So I actually did some of the first uh, yes. white papers for the Seasteading Institute, which I'm very proud of. And um, turns out a whole bunch of people were thinking along these lines. <laughs> and, and and now we're in the process of, of building polycentric order, which we is pretty are. special. We are. And you know what is really interesting, speaking about panarchy and polycentrism, that now we not only have the physical platforms, 
with its regulations and the possibility to, well, that's what we are going to have in the short term, the possibility to move your house or medium term around, but also we have like this stack of different layers of um, regulations or forms of interaction where not only you, let's say, even if you are here located in this system, you can have one regulation for when it comes to, I don't know, buying milk and the other one for when it comes to your marriage. So it is a different stack of, of like a complex network of different possibilities of interaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's dip a bit into your biological sensor perspective because I want to know more about that. Okay. So how exactly are you looking to towards biological systems for inspiration? Is it because of their decentralized or networks of information processing or multiple layers? Like we have our physical bodies, but at the same time we have more emerging processes going on here. Mm -hmm. How are you so looking at them? So there's a couple of ways to look at it. Um, one is at the level of the organism and one is at the level of the ecosystem. Yes. Okay, so there are multiple layers. Of, and, then, and then obviously um, there's so many ways to slice up the biological metaphor. I, I, yeah. I would probably bore your, your listeners. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> please. But, um, but let me try to, to unpack a couple. Okay. So the first one I think is uh, the most obvious, the obvious and the wider. I'll start with the macro. Um, and I think a good, a good way of describing the macro is just with seasteading. Yes. Seasteading yes. Is, a, is a great way. So you have these, you have these organizational units, these rule set units that are competitive yeah. and there is competition in a biological ecosystem yes. no doubt about it yes. competing for resources competing for in this case people yeah. and businesses and those institutional rules that work best one so that's a very basic evolutionary you know we're going to compete and somebody's going to win and get more or you're going to you're going to self organize into i prefer I'm gonna. I prefer vanilla rule sets, and somebody else prefers chocolate rules, yes. and they self-organize based on fidelity to those rules. Yes. Okay. So that is an evolutionary. It's both both emergent phenomenon and an evolutionary phenomenon. Yeah. Both of those things are operating in synchrony with with seasteading. Yes. But here's the interesting thing. You can also have a set of protocols internally to organizations, for example, and this scales up to the level of humanity. I don't think a lot of people realize this, but I've been very inspired by the work of a man named Brian Robertson. Brian Robertson uh, has developed a management framework called Holacracy. Oh, yeah. Okay? And Holacracy is used in companies today to completely get rid of management hierarchies. So there's no longer CEOs, no longer middle management, and no longer this sort of information processing task up and down the chains of, of command yeah. hierarchy model of the firm or some hybrid thereof. It's a fully decentralized uh, emergent system based on a set of protocols that is holacracy. It's constitution, holacracy's constitution and its governance process and its process for dealing with uh, operations. Suffice it to say, it's pretty sophisticated and it involves what they call processing tensions. Uh, but essentially, if you find something wrong or you think something should be better, you have full entrepreneurial autonomy to try it out until you run into someone else's tensions. Oh. And then there's a governance process for resolving that tension and maybe changing the rules that are always, always evolving. Okay. So those, so what you start to get is a self-organization of, of, um, of roles, of people's roles in the organization yes. based on their capabilities. So like uh, a heart muscle or a leg muscle or a kidney have different cells that do different things. Yes. Um, it's all important to the entire corpus of the organization, which is based on mission. Okay? Yeah. So those, the holacracy protocols could, could conceivably scale to the level of civilization, where you would not need democracy anymore. You would not need hierarchy anymore. We don't need it now anyway. We don't need it now anyway. So the mix of holocratic um, uh, operating system inside organizations and uh, polyarchy outside of organizations and then an eventual blending of those means that we really no longer need uh, territorial govern governments anymore. We really don't need them. And in fact, they're counterproductive. From a com complex system standpoint, they're, they are 
I, I don't know how to be nice about it. They are limiting. They got us very far indeed in, in building civilization, but they have outlived their use, usefulness. We're going from the machine <laughs> metaphor to the biological metaphor of how to organize society, and it is a beautiful thing. We are. I have the word for that. They are two entropic systems. Speaking of a complex system, too much entropy they mm -hmm. produce. Mm -hmm. You've just described something. You've just... No, let's go back to your book. This is about... So I really want to ask you something. What you just, yeah. I cannot help it, okay? Jump in What there. you just described is called heterarchy. Heterarchy. Yeah, okay. heterarchy. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the term? No. No? So heterarchy basically is somewhere in between horizontal networks, which is not possible when you have organizations or social systems because nothing, not everything can be flat, and a mix between nested hierarchies. But yes. It, so it's okay, so a fluid way of organizing. Systems within systems. Yeah. Yeah, and they're fluid. Uh, yeah. I actually know that term is not heterarchy, but um, but um, holarchy, because whole a holon is a unit of a system. Exactly. And then you have a wider holon as a nested system. Yes. And that is exactly what whole uh, holacracy, yes. the management philosophy creates, are is holarchies. Yeah. And so you do get. Some a form of a, a t not hierarchy exactly, uh -huh. but it is there are systems and levels of information processing yes. that some are contained within others. Yes, all the way down, and it's very very interesting. So yeah. yes, so you call that heterarchy. Yes, because although the Holon are the autonomous units, mm -hmm. um, I don't. Well, I'm an exitarian too. Mm -hmm. So thinking of fully coherent systems, for me, it's not not possible mm. because the system is dynamic, it changes, it evolves. It's also an open system, open, constantly processing information with metabolizing information from the environment. So I, said. I don't really like <laughs> the, the everything that is fully encompassing because, yeah, things change. Mm -hmm. And also there are different dimensions, just like in the biological organism, you have different levels of information processing. A holon for me is too flat. Mm. It's too flat. Okay. Yeah. So, and also to, uh, what would be the term, uh, not irregular enough. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I mean, from a structural point I, of view, is. We might argue about the tendency for uh, for these systems to e equilibrate and then to return to a state of more of chaos and then to equilibrate again. Um, but I think we would at least agree on the multidimensionality of, yes. of these systems and how how the the systems and subsystems deal with information in the external environment or the internal processes is in constant flux. Yes. is going to be um, developing the protocols for how that happens is vital to the existence of these new emergent yes. orders. <laughs> we, so. found a, we found a room for probably shading access. Thank you. Uh, how, so you mentioned complex systems. You have mentioned chaos theory. Mm -hmm. What do you think complex systems can bring to this post-politics and post-ideology world that you and I really want to happen. Can you repeat the, repeat the first, first part of the question? How, what can complex systems mm -hmm. bring to the fact that we are indeed heading towards this world that you describe in your first chapter? I think, um, I think complex systems are both a something that we have to look out at. It, it, to say how can we use them, or uh, I don't remember how you phrased it exactly, but they are both, I think it's about a recognition of its inevitability. I don't, I, and I, learning to think in comp complex systems terms, in my view, means to learn to establish network protocols that are highly adaptive, but are also contingent, which means they're subject to change. Yes. And so that makes us, that causes us to be a lot less doctrinaire yes. about certain kinds of things. Yes. Okay? And that everything is open to change, yes. and that, that that change will will come about as a result of a constant process of flux and flow. Yes. What unifies a system, though, is its ability to accommodate flows. 
yes. accommodate uh, yeah. information in the external environment, certain okay. things happening. How your system accommodates for flows is almost like the ultimate way of dealing with entropy. It is. It is the it's fourth the law of ther thermodynamics. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so I believe that the systems that we're talking about, how we use complex systems means how do we get on our knees and worship them and respect them yes. for what they are, which is which is the pulsating God of the universe. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's where we're headed. It's yeah. like, if you don't acknowledge that we're headed for a complex system state of affairs, either you <laughs> plunge us into a dark age I know it. or you change. Yeah, that is so true. And from a structural or network point of view, we are still in a world where our systems of governance, our political systems, even our organizations, are very top-down. They mm -hmm. have three topology, information processing is top-down, there's little feedback, there are no emerging processes. Self-organization is seen as an anomaly mm -hmm. still, but we are um, we are slowly heading towards a world, especially as we put the network mediated component into it, where the structure or the network or the topology of our systems of governance is also complexifying more as our interactions become more open, more interconnected too. So ultimately, how do you see this structure or what what network, what type of network do you see will result from a world where most of our interactions will be to a certain extent mediated by some form of holochain or blockchain or the internet? Yeah. How does that transform the structure or the topology of government? Governance. Well, it could be government, government for a while. It could be governance, um, and I think you know. I'm glad that you make that distinction on the show because we all need <laughs> rules to live by, right? I mean, that's what brings about this order. Yeah. And when we when we lack those rules, when we lack just something as simple as drive on the right, uh -huh. is is a massive uh, way to organize a complex system, yeah. right? Um, yes. Rather than to have chaos. I mean, it it's ordered chaos. Yes. Uh, to oh. the rule drive on the right. Yes. If it's the rule is do whatever the fuck you want, then everybody's running into each other and yeah. it's not good chaos. It's not ordered chaos. It's not that sweet spot. Yes. Exactly. So what, what I believe based on you know if I'm giving an answer to to your question, it it is trying to find govern governance protocols that are simple as possible, and that. Um, leave room to sort of recognize the the need for change, the need for localization. So if it's government, <laughs> we it. want to we make more, make that as local it. as possible, so uh -huh. that the entire the entire wider ecosystem doesn't isn't ca doesn't catastrophically fail. Yes. This is anti fragility that yes! Nicholas ta ta oh my talks God, about. I am loving it. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck resilience. It's actually anti uh, anti fragility. Yes. What you should be thinking about. Oh yes, my God. Exactly. I love it. Yes. So we we want to build anti fragile systems. We want to think yes. of the protocols that make them anti fragile, and we want to build in the human element to that. And part of the human element is some of the unspoken processes of community like conversations that you and I are having and yes, what I learn about yeah, you and what you learn about me um, that cannot be captured in the market and that cannot be captured um, in any AI program that's some sort of AI god. Yes. There is tacit knowledge between us right now yes. that will never be captured on, on a fucking no. server. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so we don't have to worry about, um, I don't think we have to worry about uh, anything but becoming better people, embracing the values that are going to inevitably crop up from good rules and good good protocols and flexible thinking. I think some of the ancient virtues are going to still be with us. Which are those values that you in particular highlight or live by or want to enhance in this new revolution yeah. that we are living? I think um, I think we're gonna people are going to be more visionary. Yes. I think people are going to be more charitable, but charity is going to be uh, come with stewardship. It's not going to be outsourced charity, which is government welfare. It's like, uh -huh. I'm going to go in the voting booth and, <laughs> booth and vote for this, and, and then I can feel good about myself and my day is done. Yeah. Well, I voted for the good guy, so that means I'm a good person, yes. and that's where my charity ends. No, we have to engage in community and look out for each other. Yes. This is a deeply human need, yes. and we don't satisfy it in the voting booth. 
Oh no, no, no. Um, no. So that's one thing. Um, I think another another of the virtues or another of the values of of the coming age is um, is recognition of the relationships between wholes and parts. Okay, I know that's going to sound crazy. No, no. But for this new new era, we're going to have to understand ourselves as embedded in a wider ecosystem, in a wider framework, planetary framework, yes. and that our decisions can have impacts Indeed. not only around us in a flat sense, yes. but up in layer in strata of or not strata, but holons of of activity. Yes. Um, and that means it's okay to be an environmentalist, yeah. right? Yeah. It's yes. okay to be an environmentalist. Yes. Because we are part of the entire fabric of this thing called the, the world and the universe beyond it. And a recognition of that should fill us with wonder, yeah. not with a sense of wanting to conquer it, but yeah. a sense of wanting to integrate with it in the most fluid and, and integrative, uh, or should I say... Um, beautiful and 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 s- synchronous way possible yeah where where the 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 ebbs and flows of of nature are something that we incorporate ourselves with and i see nothing about the anarchist project that and i use the a word yes the anarchist project i don't think there's anything about the anarchist project that interferes with our being stewards of the planet of course not in fact Nature is the most anarchic system that exists because it is fully self-organized. There is no central control. There is no central command. Uh, it is very complex. Information processing is at so many multiple scales at the same time. It's multi-level. Um, yeah, anarchy. Nature is anarchic. That is a fact. Absolutely. It's, it's mutual aid, actually. Network, yeah, nature well, it's, is, it is mutual aid. It's mutual aid, aid but it's also yeah. competition. It's and it can be violent competition. And, and they can be together, you yeah. know? But here's an interesting thing that some of your complex systems uh, theory people might not like. Okay, okay tell me. I'm going to piss some people off. <laughs> How do you know I'm a complex system people? <laughs> well, I'm, you, you suggest to me that there are listeners out there who like complex systems, and I think people who like seasteading oh. probably like complex oh. systems. But let me, let me okay. give you one, I think, that could be cause controversy. Okay. Family. And that is um, that hierarchies, yes. hi- control hi- command and control of hierarchies, yes. are emergent systems. Yeah, I know. Okay, so you yeah, don't disagree yeah. with that. That is why but it's some may, hierarchies, because you can yeah. have nested hierarchies that emerge in a grown-up way, and that is not bad. Well, and sometimes sometimes we have, like, uh, throughout most of human history, the reason we saw the hi- emergence of hierarchy was we were in, roving around in tribal bands. Yeah. And once there's resource competition... Uh, and scarcity, there's war. Yeah. And when you want to quickly organize yourself for war over resources, yes. You and to protect your tribe, you organize as a hierarchy. Yes. You get a chief that's giving you commands. You get out there and kill. Yes. You go to flank left. Whatever you do in a in a in a you know combat hierarchy, uh, you or you organize like the Spartans did. You know in the movie 300 with the the phalanx. Oh. But there's you know there's all there's a leader going now, shh, left, shh, <laughs> and you're operating in unison. Yes. Right, because you need a unitary decision for the entire group. Quick, quick decision. That's what hi- hierarchies are good for. Yeah. But now that we know how to self-organize beyond hierarchy, and complexity requires us to do so, we're gonna have to. So it might be there might be times when uh, we have a, some sort of fatal thing, and we're back to warlordism again. And you better damn believe you want a strong Type A type given orders. For your team to go out there and kick ass and protect the resources that are left in a warlord-like situation, yeah. you might not be able to self-organize quickly like that. Yeah. So you have to acknowledge and fall into line in a hierarchy in that situation. So it's all context-dependent. Yeah, exactly. But, but complex complexity is pulling and pulling and pulling us away from those structures, left and right. Yeah. There are going to be very very few left. And so the the title of my book, The Social Singularity, is really about Devi- developing forms of collective intelligence and collective organization that move us away from hierarchy. The point, at, the theoretical point at which that happens to such a degree that we can can't stop denying it is the social singularity. Oh my cosmos! What? Why do you think that the social singularity is near? There are. So, why now? Um, well, part of it is aspirational. But part of it is that we are standing at the cusp of a tidal wave. 
Um, and it's a tidal wave of information processing, of complexity, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, yes. We can we can look at the way information is being exchanged just on the internet, and that is not the internet of incentives. When we begin begin to program incentives through the blockchain or through other uh, holochain, through uh, what's called sovereign accountable commons, which is the holochain version of a DAO, distributed autonomous organization, oh. there are so many ways that we are going to be able to organize ourselves for superior collective intelligence, uh, sharing our resources, um, forming new market phenomena that cross boundaries. That's going to build on uh, on uh, build the complexity. In, in a what what uh, Stuart Kaufman calls the Jason oh Possible. Oh my God, why are you? Okay, so we're going to be building <laughs> layers the of, the, of the adjacent possible, ah! one atop the other, uh, in in this noosphere, this this massive super intelligence, and I believe that we're approaching that as a kind of omega point. We are. I think it's coming. I think it's coming. I think so too. And I and I just want to be alive to see it. You will. You will. So, uh, how evolution works is that first there is a moment of stasis, a bit dynamic, like dynamic, but changes, and you know this because of antifragile systems and Stuart Kaufman also, changes are sudden and abrupt, boom, and then poof, you reach a threshold, Yes. you go beyond that threshold, the whole system blah, gets shaked, and then it reaches a new state of, of organization. Mm. We mm. are right now at the edge of that critical point of transitioning yes we are yes and even even as as bleak as it was for donald trump to be elected president for many people there are a few people out there who showed me that this is a sign of the complexity transition uh people like jordan greenhall who is an incredible thinker um showed me that the trump election is a is a sign is a is a is a convulsion in the old order. It is not just a populist movement. It is literally a convulsing of the old order. It does not, It is trying to find itself. It does not want, need, know what it needs to be. There are lots of facets to it, to this phenomenon. But, the, to, to, but if you see the Trump, Trump election on the timescale of history, at the very least it shows how preposterous the installation <laughs> of a godhead is over presiding yeah. over politics. Yeah. How preposterous that has become. Yes. And that showed the people on on the classical left and right both. Yes. That at the very least that there are cracks in the system. And all around the system that's cracking now, this machinery is this ocean of complexity that is forming as we speak through tokenization, through um, companies organizing themselves around holacracy, through um, international and cosmopolitan relationships exactly. where you and I have more in common than Yay. anybody in my, me and my country just about. Yeah, 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 you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. And so we're forming our own country in the cloud, yes, you and I. I know it. <laughs> Why do you think people the majority of people are still so reticent to acknowledge this or to even recognize it. Why do you think we are, yeah, the majority of people are kind of blind and yeah. still think that my right to vote is something that is given to me with my citizenship and I should execute it because that is my right. Isn't that stupid? Well, stupid is probably um, too strong a phrase. Let me let me explain that. So, um, in um, I am very beholden to uh, a man named Don Beck, okay. who is a, a man who lives in Texas, and I've I've had the privilege of meeting him. And he developed a system on the work of uh, another uh, psychologist called Claire Graves. Okay. Okay. Don Beck and Christopher Cowan, who's passed, developed a more sophisticated, full-fledged understanding of Graves' theory called spiral dynamics. Okay. Okay. Ah. You may or may not be interested in spiral dynamics, but spiral dynamics is basically a theory of psychosocial development that um, means that people tend to have both their values and their cognitive, uh, their cognitive outlook is based on the world in which they operate. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Their environment. Yes. So, 
we are, uh, and they, and they're sometimes transitioning at different rates, and these are represented by colors. So, there are people who are still, I guess you could say, uh, in, in, in it's, it's a spiraling upward. It's ascending into levels of complexity and understanding yourself within a, a, a wider ecosystem of value that may, may or may not be perceptible to you yet. And your values are going to change. That's why I, earlier when I talked about, when you asked me what are the new values going to look like, some of that's hard to answer because the incentives of the new complex order are going to shape our values. Yeah. Yes. We shape our tools, and then yes. our tools shape us. Yes. We shape our rules, and then our rules shape us. Yes. So some of that is going to be an emergent phenomenon, and there are going to be healthy and unhealthy expressions of that. Yes. But when you think of people in terms of psychosocial development in, a, in, a, in an ever-increasing complexity, they're going to have to move up the spiral of psychosocial development. And I think whether or not you believe word for word everything about it, I think as a heuristic, as a model, we've got to pay attention to this idea. Because, so, saying people who were voting Trump, they had they were in a certain kind of environment. They yes. tended to be a certain kind of voter. Yes. And their virtues and values are fully expressed yes. at their level of psychosocial development. It makes perfect yes. sense. Yeah. Same with the people whose antagonistic response to that, you know, yes. pussy hats in the streets and. Um, you know, you're destroying the environment, and it's just in <laughs> social justice warriors. They're all part of the green stratum of psychosocial development. That is, but and both of these are first tier. They're they postulated two tiers of psycho, psychosocial development, okay. and both the the sort of social justice warrior movement or social justice movement, and um, under that is um, you know sort of commerce, just like commerce and, and science, and then beneath that is sort of Law and order and loyalty and, and belief in God. So it's like conservatives, okay. conser basic conservatives, basic libertarians, and and basic um, and science science scientist type view, rationalistic worldview. And then up from that is this egalitarian, green environmental type oh, consciousness. I, I, I okay. Understand that. Okay. And everybody as they ascend goes through these. Oh. Yeah. So once you reach second tier, you get to yellow and turquoise, and that's yeah. a very, very different state of affairs. Oh. And with second tier, you learn how to integrate the healthy expression, healthiest expressions of all the rainbow underneath you. Wow, that sounds beautiful. And use it in a, a systemic fashion for leadership. If it's if you're at, at the healthiest expression of yellow, you, you can use that for leadership. If you are at the healthiest expression of yellow. Yes, of yellow. Wow, that's more so beautiful. That's the first, phrase. That's the first <laughs> oh, wow. tier of, of spiral dynamics is called yellow, wow. and that is the this awakening that all all of these things have something to offer, yeah. and we need to take the best of them and leave the shit. Yeah. Right, yes. and, and and integrate that into a systems view, and then when we get to turquoise, the systems uh, expand to the planetary scale. So your hierarchy, yes, your hierarchy is a very turquoise phenomenon. I and know. It, yeah. And if you can begin to sacralize that understanding a little bit and imbue it with wonder and imbue it with spiritual internal energy, I don't know. It sounds really woo woo. That's a very turquoise kind of value. That sounds so beautiful, Max. It is. Wow. And I think people who are going to live on the tur turquoise water will be among the first to embrace those values. Whoa, that even that makes even more sense. That turquoise is the color of waters where we are going to put our sea steps. And this whole view, wow. Yeah. I wish I could express with words what I'm thinking with colors right now in my mind. <laughs> wow. It's a, it's a beautiful colors vision. and notes. Every time Joe and I talk about uh, sea steading together, and I'm sure he talks about it all the time, but... I can only dream color in my mind, and it's so beautiful, that vision. One of the best things you've got going for you is a seasteading movement, and even as a, as a for-profit company that's going to make this commercializable, is this beautiful vision of uh -huh. living on the sea. It's yes. just like a fucking great advertisement. Excuse my mouth, but yes. it's just like it's just like the uh, it's very spiral dy dynamics orange. Why? What uh, do you mean? The, 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 it goes down a few levels. When... Um, When President Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon. We're going to put a man on the moon. <laughs> that's a very spiral dynamics orange. That's a way of saying we're all about science and we can do anything with science. Okay. And we're, we're do that hierarchically. We do it through whatever means. And it happened to be government largesse and space race with the Russians. Yeah. It wasn't complex systems. It was just complicated systems. Yeah, yeah. Right. But. Exactly. But that, that vision is what he sold. He sold a vision of orange. 
and everybody was aspirational behind it. And yes. in the stage of development where we were at that point in American history, um, speaking it as an American, I, was, I wasn't born yet. But um, I know that people rallied behind that vision. Yeah. And I think it's exactly the same for seasteading, except wow. for seasteading, it's not going to be orange, hierarchical. It's going to be yellow and turquoise. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. And yellow is the color of the sun. Well, what we see. There you how go. How we see the sun. Yep. Turquoise, the color and of the water. And that's the first point of enlightenment. Ah, so beautiful. Yeah. How did you get to spiral dynamics? You can, um, a great book uh, is the spiral dyna- called Spiral Dynamics by Dr. Don Beck and Christopher Cowan. Wow. Wow. What is the future of governance? Well, we, we've talked about that a bit. Yeah, Maybe I mean, can... I, I think when we, when we talked about polyarchy and polycentricity, that pretty well covered it. Yeah. I think the mechanisms for that are what's really interesting. And our uh, friends in common, uh, Joe Quirk and Joe McKinney, both have really interesting things to say about how that happens from a practical standpoint. Yeah. And it requires us to be less doctrinaire. And I think that's a, an yes. important message. But yes. um, there will be weak joints and leverage points in the old system that cause that system to cede to the new yeah. system. And in, in the evolutionary framework, the jurisdictional arbitrage that the seasteaders like yeah. talking about yeah. is one way. Yeah. And then another way is just good old-fashioned lobbying and working with people who, if you can appeal to their their best instincts to improve their people, um, going to the some of the poorest and most violent places in the world and saying, you need to try something new. How about yeah. this? Is... is important and it's gonna it'll even if it's not perfect is something so wow wow well max thank you very much thank you for having me this has been an absolute pleasure no the pleasure <laughs> is mine believe me i was surprised with how much complexity you brought to the conversation oh it's one complexity of my favorite in subjects the, in the, in the, <laughs> the complexity well yeah no 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 complexity is not complicated well you're gonna love Com- the book because there's a lot of it in there i am already loving it i i love the title i love this the decentralist manifesto so i know you were you posted a message on facebook was it to choose the subtitle Oh, yes. What were your options? Um, well, and some people are going to come back and say, you should have said decentralization manifesto. because I from, put that. From the standpoint <laughs> of, of uh, SEO, that's better. So when it goes on Amazon, it'll probably be called a decentralization manifesto because that's a search term uh, that's going to be more effective. And why but did you put I the- like this for the cover of the of the print copy better because I want to... I want to... It, decentralization is depersonalizing. Decentralist yeah. says you are a member of our tribe. Oh, I love it. So that's why I chose that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So to all the decentralists out there, big love. Big love. And get yourself a copy of The Social Singularity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Thanks for joining us on the Blue Frontiers podcast. To learn more about our work and find out how you can support the project, visit blue-frontiers.com or visit our social channels. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Blue Frontiers, or shoot us a note via our website. If you learned something and enjoyed the show, tell a friend or leave us a positive review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our show and remember to join us for the next episode. See you next time.